what we had at the time is we called a unitary medical record. Mm -hmm. One patient, one record. You had a unique medical record number. You had supposedly one chart. That wasn't true, but supposedly one chart. It was housed in this airplane hangar of a building out on the Sunnyside campus mm -hmm. where they had close to a million charts. Mm -hmm. It was one of the largest single medical record facilities probably in the country. The problem with a unitary medical record was that if one person was using the record for whatever reason, it was then unavailable to everybody else mm -hmm. who needed the record. And our region was expanding, so we covered quite a bit of territory, and we had these vans running all over the place trying to deliver medical records. And if the insurance office needed the medical record, it wasn't available for clinical care. If there was a medical legal problem and the attorneys were reviewing the medical record, it wasn't available for clinical care. So, and, and if a patient, particularly um, here in Vancouver, came in for an appointment that had been scheduled less than 48 hours in advance, the chances of actually delivering the medical, you know, going to pull the medical record out in the, in the process center, putting it in the van and delivering it at the time when the patient was there for her appointment was um, at the best. If it was a 48 hour in advance, you'd get it 80% of the time. And as the time in advance shortened up, so if it was the day before, you'd get it about 60% of the time. If it was within a day, it was almost 0% of the time, and so we did what we called white sheet medicine. We had a blank piece of paper, a white sheet, and that's where we wrote our progress notes because we had no record and you had no way to get them. This was prior to fax machines and you might as well be on the moon. And what had happened is because everybody knew that the delivery of the medical record was unreliable, people were sequestering records of patients that they knew they were going to see back again, okay. which contributed to how unreliable the delivery of the record was, because if you had the record of Mr. Jones in your office because you had finished the note and you knew you were going to see him in two days again and you wanted to make sure the dang thing was there and Mr. Jones ended up needing to have another consultant, there was no record. In fact, nobody, half the time nobody even knew where it was. We had physicians becoming, creating uh, the quasi record systems. So the orthopedics department would create their own medical record system of orthopedic visits just for them so that they would make sure that they had something for follow up when a patient came back so that you would know. I mean, because if they had a compl you know, if, if somebody fractured their arm and you put it in a splint and then you put it in a cast and then they had a complication with the cast and they came in you know, that day, you were absolutely sure not to have the medical record of any of the other stuff that had been done, yeah. unless you created your own. We had quasi-medical record systems everywhere as departments tried to work around. I mean, in all good faith, they want to provide good care to the people who are coming in they know they're not doing it when they don't have any information, and the information isn't reliably and consistently delivered. What are you going to do? Well, I would do the same thing. But unfortunately, my job as the medical record policeman was to do raids and collect charts. Intuitively, I knew 
that it wasn't going to be great, but now we had the evidence to show it wasn't very good. So this was in about 1981 or so, and for the next 10 years, about every time I would run into Mary Raris, she would say, so, what's your medical record delivery rate? When, when, we, when we published what the rate was, you know, we got a response back saying, well, is this satisfactory to you? It seems a bit low. Mm -hmm. And we said, well, it seems a bit low to us too. Well, what can you do about it? And over the next 10 years, we attempted everything we could think of to improve that dang medical record delivery rate. Everything from different ways of notifying medical records of an appointment, to changing courier schedules, to adding, I think we doubled the number of vans, so the number of, of um, deliveries was doubled. Everything that we could think of over 10 years. And by about 1992, with all of these different interventions, our medical record delivery rate had climbed to the astronomical number of 83 percent. Ten years. And that set the stage for the introduction of the electronic medical record. I can remember two or three wonderfully uh, spectacular failures that we had where a company would come and say, oh yes, we can you know, link these things and can you describe one of those? Work. Uh, one was called Famous, as I remember, P-H-A-M-I-S, that <clears throat> was a company that was going to link a number of our systems. They had a, basically an appointment system, and then they were going to try to link, if you have a patient with an appointment, information from the lab and information from the pharmacy systems will be able to link to these so that you have kind of a you know, per poor person summary of stuff around this patient rather than having all of these totally independent. Yeah. That didn't work so well. Um, and what happened? We ended up, I'm trying to, re it, it just didn't deliver, it couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So we fussed with that one for about a year and then gave up. Um, so a lot of it you know, had to do with the evolution of the technology that was available, also the size and speed of the computers. I mean, having, having a lot of information on a computer that you would wait 10 minutes for, you know, to boot up and bring it up was not considered, you know, patient-friendly by the physicians who were running around. So... Um, you know, it, it, there was a lot of technological enablement that, that still left something to be desired at this point. So over time, uh, every department started looking at how do we do things around here? How do we create more consistency? And it lost the stigma of kind of big brother is looking over you to reduce your autonomy as opposed to, we can create a whole set of support tools, and I believe clinical guidelines are support tools, that help people make uh, consistent decisions on an individual patient-by-patient -patient basis. More importantly, they help us to have collective institutional memory about, well, what did we do the last 5,000 times we had this problem, and what happened, and what happened over time. And when we're able to create that institutional memory, we are miles ahead of any other non-system of care, where the institutional memory is usually the last thing that happened to the last patient that I remember.
hadn't made any investment and we hadn't even decided that we were going to make an investment, but the logical thing to do seemed to be to make an inventory and see if there was something there. They um, went off and a month or so later, now we're in, I think, late 1993, came back and said, from their perspective, the system with the most potential was put out by Epic. And we said, who are they? Epic was a small company, had 55 employees in Madison, Wisconsin. They had developed first business systems, mostly for hospitals. So they had billing systems and they had some other business systems. And they had been working on an electronic medical record, which their largest installation in the country at the time that we reviewed them was a 10 doctor office. Uh, I think they had 25 employees or 25 people on the system in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we sent Homer and Dan down to Scottsdale to see what this was. Mm -hmm. And they came back and they said, um, this system has the most potential of anything that we've seen. It actually works in this setting. And Mike and I said, yeah, but we're talking about you know, a thousand or fifteen hundred users. I mean, we're talking about orders of magnitude larger. Can they do this? And we ended up meeting with Judy Faulkner, who's the president of Epic Systems. Epic is a private company. It was then, it is now. It's owned by Judy and, and members of her family. And we said, uh, we want to hear it from you. I mean, you have a, this tiny little installation in Arizona. Can your system scale to support 1,000 users? And she said, yes. And I remember Mike and I kind of went off, talked about it for a while. We called this the big gulp decision. People came back and said, this system works. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have all the features that I really would like to have available in it. So it's kind of clunky and kind of rudimentary, but I could see, over and over, I'd have people say, I can see where we could add these features on over time, and the system has tremendous potential. So what, what was reported when Homer and Dan did their evaluation of the 55, they looked at what are the current capabilities I mean, what exists today, and how, um, and what does the potential look like to expand it, to make it do all kinds of things, add imaging, add the capabilities to um, uh, uh, scan data into it, you know, all the kinds of things that ultimately we wanted and couldn't do any of them mm -hmm. to start with, but. People said, and Epic said, well, I can see we will, we will develop these capabilities. And people could see that it had the potential that we needed. It didn't have anything much in the way of decision support. We didn't have any clinical guidelines in it. We didn't have all kinds of stuff in it. But you could enter information. You could retrieve it. It was legible. It was in a format that you could easily see what the problems were, which were the most important ones, which ones were you dealing with, what are the allergies, what are the medications. And um, for a long time, it also didn't talk particularly easily to our results reporting system. Mm -hmm. That took a bit of time. So one of, the, one of the challenges for Epic was looking at our legacy systems so all of which had totally different architectures and platforms than their system, 
and figure out how to draw in that information so that our legacy systems could populate the EPIC system. That took a while. So my role as president of the medical group was implement this system. And that's what we did. And it took two years. And by 1997, everybody was on the system. We didn't retire the medical record totally for another couple of years because we were still populating the information into the new system. And you could, I mean, you, you had to have it available. So we would still have deliver medical rec the paper record, uh, but all new visits were on the electronic record. All communications were on the electronic record. Everything was going in there. And then after we had about four years of data in there, then we stopped delivering the paper record and said, well, if there's something that happened 15 years ago, um, you can always call for it or we'll fax you, you know, an operative report from 15 years ago because it isn't going to be there. You can always get it, but we're just not delivering the record anymore routinely. And that brought us up to 1997.